Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Christmas treats. So welcome back to another video discussion. That is, we're going to talk about last year's Christmas video, which was about Christmas stockings. And the treats you find in them. So we're going to play the audio from that video. That is the voiceover. And then we're going to talk about some more things to do with Christmas treats, in particular about things that are part of our Christmas celebration and the history and etymology behind them. That's really all the intro we need. (laughs) But of course, we couldn't go into this without cocktails. We've had a couple of episodes where we've had interviews, and since we can't offer our guests a cocktail, we always feel that we really shouldn't be drinking. It's a little rude. So (laughs) so we haven't had cocktails for the last couple of episodes. But now it's just the two of us, so we do. So both of us have kind of gone out on on a limb this time. (laughs) I mean, there are lots of Christmas-themed cocktails out there, so we totally could have gone with something somebody else had made. But what did you do, Mark? (laughs) Well, I did my best to replicate a candy cane in liquid form. (laughs) It doesn't quite look like that anymore, does (laughs) it? Semi-liquid form. (laughs) Slightly coagulated liquid form. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what I did is I just, you know, the, the main flavors of a candy cane are mint just uh, mint. The main flavor mint. is mint. The main flavor. And then the colors are green and red. Green and red. And I guess sometimes cinnamon. Cinnamon. So mm-hmm. I put a bit of a dash of cinnamon. So what I did is I mixed some just purely for the cu- color, not the flavor. And I, you know, worried this may have been a mistake, but uh, <laughs> some grenadine because it's got the bright red color, which is kind of lost in the final production. But anyways, <laughs> I mixed that with a, a, a dash of the cinnamon to get the kind of cinnamony mm-hmm. red. And then I mixed some separately, uh, some creme de menthe and cream and vodka. And then I did my best to layer that minty concoction over top the red level. Mm-hmm. And it's, there's a layer there, but it's not, uh, the, it's not a very good layer. <laughs> you can see this. I've put a picture up on yeah. the uh, website so you can see the attempt. I, I'm I, I'm not laughing at you though because I've tried layered <laughs> drinks before and I've done a horrible job yeah. at it. So it's they're hard. They're hard. So I don't know. It may be somewhat reminiscent of the flavor, if nothing else, of a candy cane. <laughs> so candy the point cane. is, this is a candy, candy cane. cane. Yes. yes. And I went for reasons that will become obvious very soon for a plum pudding inspired cocktail. I'm calling it a brandied plum pudding. Therefore, its base is brandy, and there's a bit of cherry liqueur, a little bit of triple sec, some ginger liqueur. A little bit of molasses, a little bit of Orinoco bitters and Angostura bitters, which are both sort of things with sort of spices like Mm. cloves and cinnamon and things like that in them, and a little tiny squirt of lemon. So my intention is to replicate the flavors that are in a plum pudding, in a Christmas pudding. So the brandy and the molasses and the fruit and citrus and spices. So we'll see. Right. (laughs) Right. Shall we try these? Moment of truth. I'm only going to get mint from my first, you know. 12 sips. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. All right. So my first reaction to mine is I could have definitely upped the spices. Right. You could taste the cherry and the brandy. Mm-hmm. The ginger's there with a little bit of sort of spiciness at the back of the tongue, but I was worried it would overpower it, so I didn't put a whole lot in, and I think I could have put more in. And the molasses, as I noticed once I'd shaken it, because I put it in with the ice in, it didn't really mix in that much because it was so mm. thick and it was too cold. So I think the next time I do that, I will mix it before I add the ice. So more molasses mixes in, because I don't think there's enough molasses in there. Now, it may just be this sort of... Contrast? Contrast, but I could use a bit more sweetness in yours. <laughs> oh, it's But that's sweet because en- this is very sweet. Yeah, it's sweet, sweet enough. I mean, it's not sweet, 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 mm. but it's definitely sweet okay. enough. It's, it's just, it's not creme de menthe sweet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, I think what happened in mine is a bit of the cinnamon has migrated towards the top because it floats, mm-hmm. because it's a powder, powdered cinnamon. So I'm getting a bit of that, the heat... Actually, along with your mint. Along with the mint, which is actually kind of pleasant. Oh, okay. I don't know how it's going to be when I get towards the bottom where, where all the uh, <laughs> grenadines yeah. <laughs> resides, but um, the top is actually not bad. Okay, good. I'm not going to taste it because I don't like mint, mm. so. Yeah, I'm happy with mine. Mine is very tasty. It's it's perfectly nice. I just think it could do with more spiciness. It right. doesn't, I need to keep working on it to make it more spicy. Okay. And more molasses-y. Okay. Well, with that out of the way, <laughs> our, our attempts at being bartenders thoroughly quashed. 
before we start, I guess the only other thing to talk about is that we do have a new Christmas video out. So if you haven't seen that yet, head over to youtube.com slash alliterative mm -hmm. to see the new video on reindeer. reindeer. <laughs> All of the reindeer, including Rudolph, and their names and history. So that's the newest one. Also, it's probably too late by the time this goes up, but we do have a Christmas card on... <laughs> Cafe Press. Cafepress.com slash The Endless Knot, I think. There's a link in the description if you want. And it's a Christmas card from a couple of years ago, from last year, I guess we did it, with the 12 etymologies of Christmas, more specifically, the fart bird. The fart bird, the first etymology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you want one of those, but as I said, it's probably too late for you to send Christmas mm -hmm. cards, but I thought I should just mention that in case anyone wants one. All right, that's enough about all that. On to stockings. So let's listen to the voiceover for stocking and learn about why people hang Christmas stockings and what treats are in those. And when we come back, we'll talk more about that and about some other Christmas goodies. Before we get into the stockings, let's start with the word Christmas. The first part is easy, obviously coming from Christ, meaning anointed, coming from a root that means to rub, that also gives us grime, grizzly, and cream. So think about that as you eat the cream-filled chocolate you got in your Christmas stocking. By the way, the abbreviation Xmas is not a modern barbarism or an attempt to take the Christ out of Christmas, but in fact goes back to the 16th century. The X is actually the Greek letter Chi, the first letter of Christos, and was used as an abbreviation for the name. The Mass part of Christmas obviously refers to the Mass, the church service. It probably comes from the Latin phrase ita missa est, at the end of the service, meaning go, it is sent, or in other words, go, you are dismissed. As for stocking, it's surprisingly much more recent than the Old English derived sock. Stocking comes about in the 16th century from a humorous comparison to the stocks, the old punishment device that restrains the legs. So we've only just begun and we already have grim humour and grimy grisly cognates. But this gives us a clue as to what we'll find when we look under the sugar coating of the Christmas stocking and its treats. So why do we have Christmas stockings? Well, the answer to this is tied up with one of the historical traditions that leads to our modern idea of Santa Claus, that of Saint Nicholas. Nicholas, whose name in Greek means victory of the people and is therefore cognate, appropriately enough for a legendary figure with an affinity for footwear, with the sports equipment company Nike, named after the Greek goddess of victory was a bishop in the town of Myra, in what is now Turkey, in the 4th century. Myra, by the way, was named after myrrh, a kind of resin used as incense, which you'll probably remember as one of the gifts, along with gold and frankincense, that the three wise men, or magi, gave to Christ when he was born. We don't have a lot of reliable historical information about St. Nicholas's life, but there are numerous legends. Perhaps the most famous is the story about the stockings. You see, Nicholas was the son of wealthy parents, and when he inherited the money, being so pious, he decided to distribute it in charitable ways, but always secretly. One of his neighbours had fallen upon hard times, and since he didn't have the money for dowries for his three beautiful daughters, he was going to be forced to sell them into prostitution. But Nicholas came to the rescue by throwing three bags of gold on three nights in the windows of the young women for their dowries. According to one version of the story, one of the bags of gold landed in the stocking that one of the daughters had washed and hung to dry, thus apparently starting the stocking tradition. Though this is likely a later rationalization, in any case, in Nicholas's iconography, the saint is often depicted with three balls of gold representing the three bags. One of the less legendary, more historical details about Nicholas's life is that he was present at the Council of Nicaea, which was importantly concerned with the nature of Christ and his relation to God the Father, essentially decreeing that the two, along with the Holy Spirit, were on equal footing, a holy trinity. Apparently he got so pissed off at one attendee who denied this principle, believing that Christ was subordinate to God the Father, one Arius of Arian heresy fame, that Nicholas hit Arius in the face. So not so much Silent Night as Violent Night. Apparently old Saint Nick was a bit of a badass. There are also numerous miracle stories associated with Nicholas. Several of them are nautical. He is meant to have miraculously saved sailors who either fell from the mast of a ship or fell overboard, and in one story he drove the ship of his would-be kidnapper back to his home port. One famous and rather grisly story tells of how he brought back to life three boys who had been killed, cut up, and pickled by a wicked innkeeper or butcher who then tried to serve the meat to Nicholas. Ew. As a result of these many legends, Nicholas became the patron saint of many groups. In the protection of those young boys, for instance, we can see him as the patron saint of children. 
and from the story of the three daughters he's considered the patron saint of those in financial difficulty, and by extension of pawnbrokers, because he gave the daughters money. Indeed, the three balls of St. Nicholas's iconography are also the symbol of pawnbrokers, which you'll see in many pawn shop signs, though the symbol also seems to be connected to the Medici, a prominent banking family in Florence during the Italian Renaissance, and with Lombard banking in northern Italy. All this financial difficulty in pawnbroking might bring to mind the story The Gift of the Magi, not the biblical tale but the short story by O. Henry that alludes to it, in which a young couple short on money for Christmas presents for each other sells their most precious items the wife her long beautiful hair, and the husband his pocket watch, buying respectively a watch chain and fancy hair combs for each other. It's a moral, tear-jerking story about the true nature of giving, celebrating their love for each other. Getting back to Nicholas, he's also the patron saint of sailors and merchants, because of all those nautical miracles. But his role as patron saint of merchants may seem appropriate given the increasing commercialization of Christmas, I suppose the opposite of the message of that O. Henry story. And finally, Nicholas is the patron saint of repentant thieves interesting in light of what happened to Nicholas himself. He was initially interred at Myra as you might expect, but some 700 years later things changed. In the year 1087, wanting a religious attraction to bring tourist pilgrims and their money into town, a group of merchants in the southern Italian city of Bari hatched a plan to steal the bones of St. Nicholas. The story goes almost like a heist film. There was a rival group from Venice who had the same idea, so the race was on to see whose ship made it from Italy to Myra first. After duping the monks who tended the shrine of Nicholas, the merchants from Bari made off with the bones and hightailed it back to Italy, where their plans successfully turned their town into a major economic centre. So perhaps Nicholas should have been the patron saint of unrepentant thieves. Either way, it certainly reminds us again of the commercialization of Christmas, as those 11th century merchants of Bari essentially set up the first shopping mall Santa's Grotto. Unsurprisingly then, Nicholas is also the patron saint of Bari. Actually, he's the patron saint of quite a number of other places as well, including Russia, Greece, Aberdeen, Galway, Liverpool, and perhaps most importantly, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where St. Nicholas became particularly popular. Most importantly because of what happened next. The tradition developed in the Netherlands of leaving out one's shoe or boot, not stocking you'll note, to receive a gift from Nicholas, who became known there as Sinterklaas, from Sint Nicholas, with food in it for his horse named Amerigo. In the 16th century, the Netherlands came under the control of Catholic Spain, so Sinterklaas was thought to live most of the year in Spain, and when he came to the Netherlands he brought with him a Moorish sidekick who was known as Zwarte Piet, or Black Peter. His role is to threaten children who haven't been good with punishment, either by carrying them off or by leaving a switch so the disobedient child can be caned, grimly appropriate given the origin of the word stalking as a punishment. In recent years, by the way, the figure of Black Peter has been criticised as racist since he is portrayed by people in blackface makeup. This is sometimes sugarcoated by explaining it away as him simply being covered in soot from coming down the chimney, but it seems pretty clear that the figure comes from the early modern representations of Spanish Moors. In any case, all of this is associated not with Christmas, but with St. Nicholas's feast day, which is close, but not that close, on December 6th. And while the veneration of saints was de rigueur in Catholic areas, it wasn't so popular with the Protestants, who thought of it all as popish idolatry. The Protestants weren't even all that fond of Christmas, and tried to suppress it. In an effort to shift attention away from the saint at least, in Protestant areas the gift giver was shifted from Nicholas to Chris Kringle, or in German Christkindl, meaning Christ child. In other words, they tried to put the Christ back in Christmas, and properly speaking, or at least etymologically speaking, the name Kris Kringle should refer not to Santa but to Jesus. But in spite of all that puritanical suppression, Saint Nicholas held on, and surprisingly became the big deal he is today in the rather puritanical United States, founded as it was by all those Puritan pilgrims, in particular in New York. You see, New York had been founded by the Dutch and was originally called New Amsterdam. The theory goes that old Amsterdam's affiliation with Nicholas was somehow preserved there, though the historical evidence is admittedly thin. Be that as it may, New Yorker John Pintard was a big fan of St. Nicholas, and did everything he could to propagate the tradition. He tried to have Nicholas adopted as New York's patron saint, and as founder of the New York Historical Society had him adopted as that institution's patron saint. He even celebrated St. Nicholas's Day with his children in the old-fashioned way. All of this Nicholas mania on his part apparently seemed a bit silly to his pal, fellow Historical Society member Washington Irving, America's great satirical writer. Irving wrote a satirical history of New York and included in it much detail about St. Nicholas celebrations as a joke about Pintard and the Historical Society. And this book became a big hit. 
He even made fun of a picture from one of Pintard's pamphlets about Nicholas, which had the traditional boots by the fire looking a bit more like stockings, and transformed the tradition into hanging stockings for Nicholas's visit. So we may have the tradition of the Christmas stocking because of a 19th century joke. And by the time Clement Clark Moore, another member of the Historical Society, wrote his A Visit from St. Nicholas, more famously known by its first line, Twas the night before Christmas, we have St. Nick arrive, now on Christmas Eve rather than St. Nicholas Eve, to put treats in the stockings hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. So much for the Christmas stockings themselves, but what about the contents of those stockings, the sweet treats within? Well, perhaps the most famous and iconic stocking stuffer is the candy cane. The legend goes that the candy cane was invented in the 1670s by the choir master at the Cologne Cathedral who was annoyed by all the noise the children made while visiting the crash scene. Well, better a candy caning than the actual caning Black Peter had in store for disobedient children. Supposedly various elements of the confection had religious symbolism, such as the crooked cane shape representing the biblical shepherds or the bishop's crozier, like that of St. Nicholas. Or flip the other way, the letter J for Jesus and the red and white colours, clearly Christmas colours, the blood and purity of Christ respectively. Unfortunately, there's very little historical evidence for any of this, with no mention of the popular Christmas confection earlier than the 19th century. However, appropriately enough, a machine for automatically making the curved shape was invented by a Catholic seminary student, Gregory Harding Keller, who spent his summers off working in a candy factory, which he patented as the Keller machine. As for the name candy cane, it too only goes back to the 19th century, though the words candy and cane are particularly ancient, perhaps thus making up for the rather fuzzy historical evidence for the candy cane itself. Both words interestingly are traceable back to non-Indo-European roots, candy coming from an Indian Proto-Dravidian root passing through Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic and French on its way, and cane through French, Latin, Greek and Assyrian all the way from language isolate Sumerian from a root which also gives us words such as canal, canister, canon, canyon and channel. Another sweet treat indelibly associated with Christmas is the sugar plum, visions of which danced in the heads of the children in Clement Clark Moore's poem, and I'll bet you're already hearing in your head Tchaikovsky's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy from the Nutcracker at the mere mention of them. But what actually are they? Well, here's where the literal sugar coating comes in, but they're surprisingly not sugar coated plums, but instead sugar coated seeds or nuts. They're probably called plums just because they resemble them in shape and size, but historically they never contained plums or fruit of any kind. The process of sugar coating layer by layer was so laborious and difficult that they were a real luxury item, so much so that the term was soon used figuratively to refer to something pleasing or desirable, especially when given as a bribe. In fact, this figurative sense is actually attested in writing long before the literal sense as a confection. So I guess we could say that those candy canes given as bribes to silence children were actually sugar plums. Etymologically speaking, plum is pretty straightforward, coming from Greek prumnon of the same meaning, possibly borrowed from another language of Asia Minor such as Phrygian. We get the word twice in English, once through the Latinate side as prune, and again through the Germanic branch where pr becomes pl as plum. Makes sense, no? As for sugar, the word comes into English via Persian, Arabic, Latin and French, ultimately from the Sanskrit root sharkara, originally meaning the less appetizing sounding gravel or grit. I guess the sugar coating got sugar coated itself. Another favourite in the stocking are treats made from the almond based marzipan. The origins of both the confection and the word itself are debated and uncertain. The folk etymology is that the word corresponds to Latin marci panis, meaning Mark's bread, or martius panis, meaning March bread. Indeed, the earlier form of the word in English was marchpane until it was reborrowed from German as marzipan. One modern theory about the word is it comes from Arabic mavaban, meaning literally king who sits still. The word, Latinized as matapanis, was applied to Venetian coins, also known as Venetian grossi, with a picture of Christ enthroned on them which were kept in ornate boxes which then also came to be referred to by the same word, and later when the coin was out of circulation and the boxes were used to hold confections, those received the name. Well, it does seem a bit of a stretch, but the Christ connection would certainly make marzipan appropriate for Christmas. Another theory is that the word comes from a Burmese port named Martaban, which was famous for its export of fancy glazed jars containing sweets or preserves, and again the word transferred from the container to the contents. The patron saint of merchants might prefer this theory. Speaking of Christmassy bread-related folk etymologies, 
the bread in gingerbread isn't actually bread. The word gingerbread comes from Old French jange bras, meaning gingered or preserved ginger, with the bras ending eventually being replaced by folk etymology with bread. The word ginger itself has a long history twisting back through such languages as Latin and Greek to Sanskrit roots, if you'll pardon the pun, meaning horn and body, in reference to the shape of the spicy root. Though this may in fact be yet another folk etymology, with the word coming into Sanskrit from a Dravidian root. Gingerbread seems to have made its appearance in Europe in the 11th century, imported from the Middle East by the Crusaders. The first recorded instance of gingerbread being shaped into figures is often claimed to be in the 16th century, when Queen Elizabeth I had figures of her guests made out of gingerbread. There's also a story of Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III in the 15th century using gingerbread likenesses of himself to bolster public opinion of him. The folk tale of the gingerbread man who runs away from a series of pursuers first appears in print in an 1875 issue of a children's magazine called, coincidentally enough, St. Nicholas magazine. The other Christmassy tradition relating to gingerbread is the gingerbread house, which may have its origins in the Hansel and Gretel folktale, recorded by the Brothers Grimm. Of course, no Christmas stocking would be complete without some chocolate in it, and you probably know that chocolate comes from Mesoamerica, as does the word, coming into English through Spanish, though the exact root is unknown. One possibility is that it comes from Aztec Nahuatl roots, meaning bitter water. Or the first element may come from the Yucatec Maya word meaning hot, so hot water. Either way, it's clear that originally chocolate was something you'd drink, and solid chocolate wasn't a thing until the 19th century, so in fact that's the earliest you'd find it in your Christmas stocking. And finally we come to that sweet orange nestled in the toe of the stocking, whether it's a mandarin, a satsuma, a tangerine, or a clementine. Mandarin surprisingly isn't a mandarin word, or any Chinese word at all, though it was used to refer to Chinese officials and thence the language they spoke. It comes into English from the Portuguese, who picked it up from Malay, ultimately from Sanskrit mantran meaning counsellor. This word is derived from Sanskrit mantra meaning counsel, from man meaning think, ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that also gives us mind. The word was applied to the fruit because it was reminiscent of the yellow robes worn by the mandarins. Satsuma and tangerine are both toponyms, reflecting where the fruits were imported from, Satsuma province Japan and Tangier Morocco respectively. The word tangerine was originally applied as an adjective to anything from Tangier, such as a person from the town. The name of the city was said to have come from Tingis, the daughter of the Greek god Atlas, but probably comes from a Semitic root meaning harbour. And as for clementine, well it's an eponym after the French missionary Clément Rodier who first bred the fruit in Algeria. But although the fruit itself comes from far afield, its symbolism in the stocking takes us back to that first story of Nicholas, as it's sometimes held to represent those same gold balls that were old Saint Nick's anonymous present to those three daughters in Myra. So to, I guess, pull that all together, the main theme there, you know, using that sugar coating metaphor is to uncover the true and often unsavory stories behind some of these Christmas traditions. Unsavory being, well. No, but they are sa savory, savory, not sweet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, Nicholas was originally this rather stern figure associated with punishment as well as, as much as he was with reward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with leaving the, the switch in the stocking or shoe or whatever for punishing the bad children. And the punishment elements of it all further emphasize the etymological connection between stocking and stocks. Yeah, I think that is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And weird. <laughs> and weird, yes. And of course we have the grisly story of the butchered and pickled young boys mm -hmm. brought back to life by St. Nicholas. We also have the, the sort of commercial commercialization of Christmas reflected in uh, the, the patron saint, Nicholas being the patron saint of merchants and pawnbrokers, mm -hmm. and that merchant syndicate of Barry stealing the bones of Nicholas. <laughs> yeah. An additional uh, detail to that particular story that I didn't mention in the video was that as they tried to s sail away with the spoils of their heist, mm -hmm. um, a storm was said to have blown up, keeping them from departing, so keeping them from leaving right. the harbor. They were right. trying to make a quick escape, um, and they couldn't leave because of the storm. And it wasn't until it was found to have been caused by the storm to have been caused by one unscrupulous, or should we say even uh, more unscrupulous than the others, 
uh, who had uh, secretly stashed some of the relics for his own purposes, ah. probably to sell them on the relic black market, <laughs> which there certainly was one in yep. the Middle Ages. Absolutely. Um, and so it was only once all of Nicholas's bones had been gathered together in one place to be transferred to the, its new home that the ship was able to leave mm -hmm. uh, harbor. Right. So I guess another one of uh, his miracles, his miracles so, yeah. stories. Yeah. Some other nice details about St. Nicholas, or some nice, some not so nice. Um, <laughs> he knows when <laughs> you've the been, case being, yeah. goes. Not some nice, some naughty? Some naughty, yes. So, it, I mean, it should be further emphasized that St. Nicholas is not a Northern European, in no. spite of the way he is, you know, commonly pictured in the sort of Western tradition as Santa Claus, mm -hmm. you know, this old guy. St. Nick, he's Saint from Nick. Antioch or somewhere in... Yeah. Turkey or... Yeah, what is modern-day Turkey? Yeah. His ethnicity is unclear, but yeah. he's certainly Eastern Mediterranean. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so people often complaining about black mall Santas and so forth. Mm -hmm. This should be firmly kept in mind. <laughs> and there is an, one other explanation of the sort of Zwarte Piet tradition that it represents some holdover of Germanic myth of... Odin, that the figure comes from Odin's ravens. That's why they're black. Uh, that's why he's uh, black. Yeah. This is, to my mind, really tenuous and, and you know. Almost certainly made up. Almost certainly made up. <laughs> yes. So I don't buy that at all. But I should mention that because it will often come up in online discussions right. of, of, you know, is, is the figure racist or not? Right. And I think it's without a doubt pretty clearly a racist figure. A it comes out figure. of a racist comes background. It doesn't mean the people who are doing no. it now feel that way about it, but nonetheless... The figure is originally a slave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no other way to put it. An extra story about Pintard, our first Santa Claus aficionado. Right. Or right. In New York. In New York, yeah. yeah. So I, I mentioned that he celebrated St. Nicholas's Day with mm -hmm. his family, and there is this one... <laughs> kind of creepy story, actually, when you think about it. Apparently, one year he made a life size model of the saint, affixed it to wheels, and sort of pulled him out, I guess, on a string or something. So he sort of came out on his own as if he was some living thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like in their house? In their house to entertain his children. Mm. And supposedly his son, well, immediately screamed out and said that his dear departed brother was back. Poor child is probably <laughs> scarred for life. Well, isn't that lovely? <laughs> it's just my ongoing crusade to spoil Christmas for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I think he managed it for his kids. He so. managed it for his kids. <laughs> yeah, you don't hear anything in, in the history books about his children carrying on their father's crusade of you know, <laughs> Christmas holidays or the St. Nicholas holidays anyways. So... <laughs> this is another amusing little detail that I, I didn't have time to mention. But when Washington Irving took up the story of St. Nicholas, mm -hmm. he actually published it in a, a larger history of New York mm -hmm. under the suitably Dutch sounding pseudonym Dietrich Knickerbocker. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said, the book became a huge success, mm -hmm. so much so that the word Knickerbocker became, if you'll pardon the pun, a nickname. Right. For New Yorkers. <laughs> For various New York related things. So New Yorkers themselves were Knickerbockers. And uh, that's they're... where we get the New York Knicks. Knicks. Yeah. There's a very sports team, sports mm -hmm. teams, um, the New York Knicks. And this story also, I guess, transferred or this this name transferred over to uh, Knickerbocker trousers, the supposed trousers that the Dutch wore. Mm hmm. Or Dutch, people so of they Dutch hadn't been war. called that before. They hadn't been called That's that That's not before. what Knickerbocker meant. No. What did no. Knickerbocker mean? Knickerbocker didn't... As a name. As a name? Well, I guess he just invented it, but I don't know he if He just it, invented it as sounding as Dutch? As sounding Dutch. I don't know if he drew it from somewhere or, or but not, it but doesn't... I think it just invented... It wasn't attached to other okay. sort of Dutch things before okay. him. Hmm. It became this sort of stand-in word for anything Dutch. Right. For and, American in, Dutch. American Dutch yeah. in particular. Yeah. And... From that, also the British term knickers, referring really? to ladies' underwear. But, but again, just from his story. Just from his story. Weird. <laughs> so I guess that joke really had legs. Oh, 
Can, okay, this is over now. We're done. <laughs> We're done. This podcast is over. Forget all the stuff I did research for. That's it. Okay, drink more of your horrible looking drink. <laughs> oh, it's getting into the uh, grenadine part. That's not so pleasant. <laughs> right. Possibly not next time. <laughs> no. I think I'd modify this somewhat. <laughs> All right, so that's all the sort of pick up from the yeah all the bits I had to leave out okay. yeah. So what we thought we'd do is talk about some of the treats or Christmas specific dishes, in particular desserts, though not only, that are part of our holiday festivities and some of the traditions associated with them. There's a lot of holiday and festive uh, dishes, yeah. cookies, and all sorts of things in all sorts of different traditions. So we're not going to cover all of them, but particularly the ones that my family has tended to do are some mm. of the British mm -hmm. traditions, and yours has uh, picked up on a couple of some of the French Canadian, Canadian traditions. Mm -hmm. So we thought we'd stick to those. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the Christmas pudding, mm -hmm. which is very iconic for Christmas in a certain tradition. It's plum pudding mm -hmm. or Christmas pudding. Now, I did a bunch of looking for stuff, and as with many of these kinds of things, I found a lot of people with exactly the same stories, most of which seem to go back to one book, which is a popular book that had very little citations or footnotes, and I couldn't find any good evidence for what it said. So, I've got a bunch of different stories about where plum pudding comes from, and we'll see what we can do with that. Okay. <laughs> So the first thing is, why is it called plum pudding? One source, and this is, seems to be the source that everyone online uses right mm -hmm. now, is Food and Cooking in Victorian England, A History by Andrea Broomfield, 2007. And in that, Andrea Broomfield says that plums used to mean raisins. So the point is that in a plum pudding, there are no plums. Right. There are instead a lot of raisins of different kinds, mm -hmm. as well as currants, cherries, uh, nuts, peel, which is usually candied citron peel and sometimes mm -hmm. lemon and lime peel. Those are what's actually in it. So why is it called a plum pudding? So you looked up whether plums means raisins. Yes. And this does seem to be true. Mm -hmm. So since 4A in the Oxford English Dictionary under the word plum says a dried grape or raisin as used in puddings, cakes, etc., so that does seem to be a legitimate use of the word to refer to raisins, right. using plum to refer to raisins, um, in specifically the context of these Baking, kinds of, yeah. this kind of confectionery. And it's now not used that scent in that way. It's a historical... Mm -hmm. Except in these fixed. Except in, in this one context. The earliest attestation of this is in the, the phrase plum pottage, mm -hmm. specifically. I'll come back to that. Okay. So the name was probably retained after the replacement, according to the OED, of dried plums or prunes by raisins in certain recipes. Right. So that they originally were prunes. prunes. Probably now, dried prunes, yeah. not necessarily in plum puddings, but other types of plum-based recipes, mm -hmm. various types of plum-based recipes. Right. And that they, the plum was phased out and replaced by raisins. Uh, raisins but the dishes and, kept being kept, called plum whatever. And so the raisins themselves were referred to as plums in that particular context. Right. Okay. So that part is probably broadly speaking true. Yeah. So this book says, and this is a widely quoted story, mm -hmm. and I could not find anything really firm to back it up, that the association between plum pudding and Christmas... And I'm going to come back to what a plum pudding, where mm -hmm. it comes from. But for the moment, why, you know, why plum puddings at Christmas? That the association between plum pudding and Christmas is said to go back to the church's decree, or in the, this book, the Catholic church's decree in the medieval period, which is where you know, start to really worry because right. there was no there such no thing as a Catholic, Catholic church, church in the medieval the, period. Before the Protestant Reformation, yeah. that term Exactly. No what sense. does that mean? So... This is worrying. And she quotes it, but in English, and in English that is clearly not Old or Middle English, mm -hmm. and therefore, and gives, the, well, no okay, I admit I was looking it up online and I couldn't see her footnotes. Okay. So maybe she gives a source. But Wikipedia, which refers to her book in order to say this has no attest, there's no evidence for this, mm -hmm. couldn't find any evidence, says that the church decreed that pudding should be made on the 25th Sunday after Trinity, 
and should be prepared with 13 ingredients to represent Christ and the apostles, and that every family member stir it in turn from east to west to honor the Magi. Hmm. Now, if that's the Catholic Church's proclamation, why is it only in England that this happens? Right. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me mm-hmm. that that would be a medieval proclamation. Hmm. And anyway, since when does the Catholic Church tell you? Anyway, I don't understand, and I can't find... I looked up this proclamation and I found it on like all sorts of websites, all of which quoted it exactly in the same words. From that book. Presumably. presumably yeah. Or maybe the book was quoting it from those websites. I couldn't tell. Mm. But none of them gave any source other than to say the medieval church proclaimed it. Hmm. So I, I admittedly, I only did a couple of days of research on this. I haven't done a, a massive mm-hmm. amount. But I would be interested to know what actual source this is drawing from. Right. Because I'm highly suspicious. So if you know the source, let us know. Let us know. So given that, you know, so this thing says that it's medieval, but recipes for plum puddings in our actual cookbooks only appear in the 17th century and later. Hmm. That's quite late. (laughs) That's quite late. That ain't medieval. Yeah, yeah. Plum pudding does appear in Ben Johnson's 1616 Christmas, His Mask as a child of Father Christmas. So it does look like by the 17th century, 1616, Mm -hmm. it's not a recipe, but it's a mention of plum pudding, it's associated with With Christmas. Christmas, So, okay, Mm -hmm. so clearly plum pudding is associated with Christmas to the extent that it can become an iconic element of a story by the early 17th century. So I'm not arguing that. Now, the other part of this idea that plum pudding becomes associated with Christmas is stir up Sunday. So Ah. stir stir up Sunday is the... 25th Sunday after Trinity, or Mm -hmm. the 5th Sunday before Christmas, when the Church of England Book of Common Prayer, so notice that's not the Catholic Church, the Church of England Book of Common Prayer's collect for that day Mm -hmm. is, stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works may by thee be plenteously rewarded. And that has become (laughs) the traditional day that you make the plum pudding. Right. Because plum pudding in its current incarnation should sit for a while, up to a year sometimes people make it ahead of time, but at least a while Mm -hmm. in order to be at its best Mm -hmm. by Christmas. So that's become the traditional stir up Sunday. So, I mean, that's true. That is the collect for the fifth Mm -hmm. Sunday before. And it is now stir up Sunday and people do make their puddings on that day. Right. But how long that goes (laughs) back and whether that's intentional, that's a whole other. Yeah, yeah. You know, this looks to me like a story made to justify right. calling that mm-hmm. Stirrup Sunday. That said, where does plum pudding come from? Well, I went back, I looked at a bunch of stuff, the World Encyclopedia of Christmas and various other things. And interestingly, there's a number of different stories about what it comes from. The idea that plum pudding predecessors often contained meat as well as sweet ingredients. Mm-hmm. That before they became steamed in a cloth, so... Now, when you make a plum pudding, you use a pudding basin, which is a yeah. ceramic or metal thing with which can be covered with um, parchment paper or with a lid, and you put it in water on a water bath and cook it. Mm-hmm. Before that, it would be put in a floured cloth, and you'd wrap it and boil it in water. Yeah. Before that, it would be stuffed into animal intestine. Yeah. Sheep stomach, right? Sheep stomach. Well, or other or types other, of intestines right. into the gut, like sausages, right? right? So it could be like a haggis or a sausage. Right. Origins of it appear to go back to pottage. Mm-hmm. And that's, you mentioned, right. plum pottage. Or porridge, which is sort of a loose grain-based mm. cooked dish cooked in a pot, right? Right. Another book called Christmas Watching by Desmond Morris. Mm-hmm. Traces it back to f- traces that pottage all the way back to frumenty, mm-hmm. which is a medieval thing. Frumenty comes from a Latin word for meaning grain, mm-hmm. and calls it a Celtic tradition, mm-hmm. specifically tying it to. And I'm going to quote: "The harvest god called the Dagda, whose eternal task was to stir a huge cauldron. Inside the cauldron was a porridge made up of all the good things of the earth. As long as he kept stirring, the harvest would be successful." And then, says this person, to honor him, the Celts would imitate him, stirring and serving porridge at their feasts to sort of encourage him mm-hmm. to keep going. And it started off as just basically grain, but then after over time, they'd add fruits and meats to that mixture. That This was popular through the 17th century. And then in the 1670s, the porridge was thickened and became wrapped so you could hmm. steam it and 
a variant of what the pudding we know today mm -hmm. started to happen. And then over time, the meat was dropped out mm -hmm. of it and became a sweet pudding right. instead. Though I should say that Christmas pudding to this day has suet in it. Yes. Which is uh, beef fat. Right. So while meat overall has been dropped, meat fat hasn't, hasn't been dropped. Been it's, dropped yeah. it's, not, mm -hmm. it's still got meat essentially mm -hmm. in it. So that ties it to a Celtic religious so, tradition. Right. Now, again, I don't say that that's impossible, the porridge mm -hmm. connection, and it may well be true, but again, the, you know, he doesn't give a lot of sources. Yeah. It was hard to find, and I'm always a little skeptical about yeah. Celtic traditions because we have such bad yeah. sources for Celtic mythology. So that may be part of what comes into this story. Now, you know, a bit of a word both in Desmond Morris's favor and possibly against him. <laughs> he is quite important for his research on gesture. So he he mm -hmm. does he's has done, you know, very scholarly work on gesture mm -hmm. in human culture. Right. I think that Christmas book was done as a bit of a, you know, holiday Yeah. The book fluff piece. that book is it's a very sort of it has yeah. it's it's organized around questions. Why yeah. do we eat Christmas yeah. pudding? And that seems nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's just that it doesn't therefore yeah. it doesn't give sources for what it mm -hmm. says. It just tells you it. So there's mm -hmm. no way to trace what he's mm -hmm. saying. So anyway, that's an interesting point to add mm -hmm. to it. Now, interestingly, <laughs> the best source of what puddings were, maybe not the medieval puddings, because I think the the, the idea that it comes from um, the puddings in general, so all British puddings, mm. which is a particular kind of thing, come out of these porridges. Yeah, That seems to be pretty clear, that you'd have these pottages or porridges that mm -hmm. were thickened over time, you added a bunch of stuff to them. They were grain-based. You could mm -hmm. add all sorts of different fruits and meats. And certainly the medieval habit of adding fruit and meat to the same thing, very clearly attested. And we'll come back to that. So that's not at all surprising. And that somewhere along the way, and it seems to be in about the 17th century, they started to be thickened and steamed or right. boiled. Right. The progression. So boiled in a cloth. And then over time, it was in the 19th century, really, that they moved them into putting basins. Basins when they could, where they could steam them. Where they could steam them because they became, um, they became more and more sort of delicate as, and the boiling would kind of knock them around and they wouldn't look so good because they wouldn't be, they'd be sort of deformed. Mm -hmm. So they developed these basins so that they could be steamed, which would lead them to look prettier. Right. So that progression seems to be pretty straightforward, but that applies to all puddings. Right. You know, there's all sorts of puddings, not right. and and plum puddings were not only served at Christmas. So plum puddings are a type of pudding, mm -hmm. and as you said, that thing about it being prunes changing to raisins, mm. um, damson plums seem to be very very common, and that makes sense in England because they're native, right? So they're much easier to have. Whereas mm. raisins, in general, come from elsewhere. And I'll speak to that in a moment. Yeah. So raisins and currants, mm -hmm. I mean, currants are Corinth raisins, mm -hmm. come from elsewhere. So they're more expensive. So over time, that becomes more, you know, these more exotic ingredients get used. So that does make sense that it would be plums or prunes mm -hmm. before it became raisins and currants. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. What seems to have happened is essentially plainer plum puddings could be cooked year round. But for Christmas, you would make one that was as fancy as you could afford. Right. So a plum pudding, for instance, didn't even necessarily have any eggs in it. It would be breadcrumbs and fruit and some liquid, a little bit of liquid, maybe ale, maybe just water and some fat, suet or lard mm -hmm. or something like that. And you'd cook that up and put it in a, or you'd stir it up and put it in a, a cloth and boil it, mm -hmm. right? Or before that, just stir it up. For Christmas, you would make one with as much as you could afford. So if you could afford some more eggs or eggs at all mm -hmm. and more fruit and right. more spices. Right. So the plum pudding you had at Christmas might be fancier than the plum pudding you had at other times of the year mm -hmm. because it would have more luxurious things in it. Mm -hmm. But it didn't mean you didn't have plum puddings at any other given time of the year, especially for fancier dinners because it would be a fancier mm -hmm. dessert, but at any other time. The other story that is in that first book that I'm mm -hmm. suspicious of is also much repeated. One part of it is definitely clear. In the 1660s, plum pudding was banned by Puritans when they were banning all the Christmas-related right. stuff. Well, they hated As, everything. Yeah, they hated everything. <laughs> but it was too luxurious. It was too rich. So they right. banned it. But the story that the book says is that under George I, sometimes known as the Pudding King, <laughs> the pudding came back to popularity. Mm -hmm. 
because he requested it be served at his first Christmas in England after he came over from Germany in right. 1714. But it's in Broomfield with no citation, mm -hmm. and Wikipedia says it's completely uns unsubstantiated. Right. So I don't know what to think of that. Okay. The best source I found for the history of the pudding was an article about Hawaiian and other Polynesian foods and how Captain Cook's crew called them puddings. So this was a particularly bizarre source. It's called Translating the 18th Century Pudding, and it has a really good history of puddings and one that is scholarly and does have sources and primary references for the history of the European, of the British pudding. Not all the way back to the medieval necessarily, but going back to the English and the uh, North American hasty puddings, which are these stirred puddings, mm -hmm. not cooked on the stove. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, previously to other puddings, and in particular uses a, a diary by a particular clergyman in which he recorded what he ate every day for like 40 years. <laughs> so so you can see how often, and he eats it's the sort plum. of thing they did back then. Yeah. For the purposes of the study, the diaries of Country Parson and Gourmand, the Reverend James Woodford of Western Longville, Norfolk, provided important contextual detail. Using John Beresford's selections from Woodford's diaries, I tabulated 282 references to puddings of the period 1788 to 1802. <laughs> Although 57 were simply referred to a pudding or baked or boiled pudding or plain or rich pudding, 225 entries specified the type of pudding eaten, sometimes with details of the course in which it was served. <laughs> so she goes on to talk. And it's very interesting, actually, because there's savory puddings and sweet puddings and plum puddings were by far the most common and the most prestigious being served on formal occasions, such as the day set aside for the tithe audit in late November. November, early December, okay. when the parson provided dinner for his tenant farmers, and on Christmas Day, when the puddings were usually accompanied by mince pies, but they were not limited to such events. May 2nd, July 13th, unspecified plum puddings were served on October 30th and November 4th. So they were served at other times too, but they were clearly a, a special dish. Right. So it's a very interesting article, and her point is essentially that um, the Polynesian dishes that are not very similar. She, she she draws some interesting comparisons between them and, and explains why Captain Cook's crew would think to compare these to puddings because they understood the importance of these special dishes in the Polynesian culture and the role that puddings have right. in British culture. And she talks about how puddings became, by the 17th and 18th century, sort of emblematic of British cuisine mm -hmm. and of nationhood. Like they're, they're a national dish. Right. But it was just funny that that was the only place I could find anything about the actual history of the pudding was in this article that's mostly about Polynesian food. All of that to say that there's this history then of porridge to steamed puddings to Christmas pudding that takes us from medieval to Victorian. Mm -hmm. And over time, the plum pudding as a particularly fancy version of a pudding becomes more and more associated with Christmas simply because it's associated with special dinners. And then eventually, in particular in the 19th century, as so many of the Christmas traditions we think of as being old traditions are actually only go back to the 19th century, this too um, served decorated with holly to represent the thorns of Christ's crown and the blood from his wounds <laughs> and surrounded by flaming brandy. That flaming brandy, like snapdragon, another thing my family does, oh, which yeah. is flamed brandied raisins, is often said to link Christmas to Celtic traditions. There again, we get this Celtic loud right. idea. And to Druids and the winter ceremonies of fires that give power to the declining sun and hold back the dark and the cold. Again, I, I, I'm always a little suspicious of that. I don't think it's impossible, but you know, if it's, if it's something that really comes about in the 19th century, the flaming pudding we don't really hear talked about until the 19th century, and Dickens in particular. So how Druidic is it going to be if we don't really mm. hear about it till then? But anyway, that whole idea and the trinkets for luck, you bake a thimble and a button and a ring and a coin into it. And people who get those, if you get the thimble, you're going to be a spinster. If you get the button, you're going to be a bachelor. If you get the ring, you're going to be married. If you get a coin, you're going to get wealth. Those traditions also, um, they may well go back further, but they're really not documented until, mm -hmm. not well documented until the 19th century. So there's where we get our, our pudding from. And... As with so many of our Christmas traditions, it really is encapsulated in Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Yes. Where we have it described in one of the Cratchit's feasts, one of the ghosts' stories of their Christmas. Right. Not the actual one that they actually have. Right. One of the, the potential feast, I think. Okay. 
And then it becomes this absolutely important thing. One of the interesting things is that it continue. It is very important in the U.S. as well. Really? Yeah, especially in the 19th century, once they sort of aren't so mad at Britain anymore. Mm. There's a revival of a lot of British traditions. And one of the other articles that I read that was really interesting, but less important for this mm. more older history, was about the development of Christmas traditions in America called The Ideal Christmas, Gastronomica, by Kathy Kaufman, which talks about how Christmas wasn't all that important in the Puritan America. Yes. And it was later and sort of towards the beginning, you know, before and after the Civil War, that it becomes this much more important feast and celebration and a holiday and and how they are there's a lot of confusion about what kind of meal it should be and it isn't until the 20th century really that it gets settled on what it is now with the turkey and things right. like that and how much of that is to do with dickens I wonder how much of this is the influence of Sarah Jose- Josepha Hale. Oh, I'm sure part of, she part was of it big, is that too, yeah. Big yeah. influencer of domestic customs mm-hmm. uh, and was not only a huge supporter of the Thanksgiving mm-hmm. tradition, but also of Christmas. She yep. apparently uh, was responsible for introducing the Christmas tree to America. Right. She picked it up from the royal family right. in Britain, yeah. specifically Prince Albert's mm-hmm. Germanic heritage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, then introduced in the, the US. US yeah yeah so a lot of this stuff doesn't seem to happen until around the ni- the turn of the 20th century yeah. actually yeah. like it's really quite mm-hmm. late and so that was an interesting article as well I don't want to expand too far on it but it, I I found it very interesting uh, I'll put links to all of these in the show notes okay. of course I will just say just for the record I think it's maybe a little interesting I'm not going to give you all the details of our recipes but our christmas pudding so we became we became the ones who made the Christmas pudding hmm. 2005, actually, okay. just or 2004, I guess, just before Nancy died. Mm-hmm. So my grandmother, my father's mother, who was Scottish, had always been the one who made the Christmas pudding and the Christmas cake, which we'll get to. And then she decided she was getting kind of tired of making it and passed on her pudding basin and the recipe to me a couple of years before she died quite suddenly. And so I still have her Christmas pudding recipe, which she had been, she had taken from her mother-in-law, I think, had given her the recipe. So, you know, it goes back a good several generations. And it it just amuses me because it's still, I still have it in in these very British terms, Mm. you know, eight ounces of flour, half a pound of breadcrumbs, a quarter of a grated nutmeg, half a pound of suet, six ounces of demerara sugar, one pound of raisins. The recipe that I ca- copied it from told you to stone the raisins and wash them and pick them over, right. which all the old recipes tell you to do. Mm-hmm. That is, take out the seeds. Right. But of course, we don't, our raisins don't have seeds in them right. and they haven't, but used to. Mm-hmm. Imagine having to sit and take the seeds out, of, out of every, every raisin. raisin. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can see why these were luxury dishes, yeah, yeah. eh? And so that's currants and, and it's all in, in weight, mm-hmm. which I know to your to our UK listeners will sound completely reasonable, but North America, we don't use weights. No, we do. Whether for good or, or bad, yeah. for good or bad, we don't. So it's, I always have to pull out the scale and it's unusual. And then, uh, you know, four to five te- tablespoons of rum or brandy, one small bottle of stout or ale, <laughs> whatever that means. And a tablespoon of black treacle, which is not something we can get or right. molasses. Mm-hmm. So that's our recipe for it. And it has almonds and eggs and lemon. And it doesn't actually have any... It only has nutmeg as the only spice in it. Right. It's very plain. But it's also very good. So that is our pudding. And we make it every year. We've already made ours. We made it a few weeks ago. And it's sitting on our shelf, mellowing so that mm-hmm. we can reheat it, re-steam it on Christmas when we go to Christmas, to my parents for Christmas. We we didn't talk about the, the word pudding. Did you have anything to say well, about the word pudding? Well, let me backtrack pudding? before I get into the word pudding itself. Mm-hmm. To talk about those raisins. Oh, yes. Which were called plums. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Various kinds of desserts made with dried fruit became a vogue in Europe, like gingerbread that I mentioned in yeah. the video. Yeah. They seem to have been brought back by those medieval crusaders. So, uh, right, so that right. taste for that kind of a, a dessert came, came from that, it seems. So... As a result, a lot of the words for types of dried fruit come from Eastern sources. Eastern sources. Yeah. So as you mentioned, currants mm-hmm. is a toponym from Corinth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so Corinth, Corinth raisins. raisins. Yeah. yeah, becomes current. And we also, I think your recipe calls for sultana raisins yeah. in particular. Mm-hmm. The word sultana is the title of the sultan's wife. Right. 
Now, yes, to move on to the word pudding itself, it either comes from French boudin, meaning sausage, from Latin botulus, <laughs> which also gives us the word, though hopefully Botch. not the disease, botulism, <laughs> or it comes from a Proto-Germanic root pud, P-U-D, mm. from a Proto-Indo-European root beu, which means to swell. So you can imagine mm -hmm. a pudding cooked in a sheep's stomach, intestines or yeah. stomach or whatever would sort of swell up when you cooked mm -hmm. it. This root, by the way, also gives us the words pudgy, <laughs> perhaps appropriate if you eat too much pudding, as well as the word pout. Oh, okay. Yes. So speaking of, you know, bed or not, ben pout. pout. <laughs> Telling you why. <laughs> why. Now, as yet another song goes, we sometimes refer to these Christmas puddings as figgy puddings. Yes. Right. So the word fig goes back to some pre-Indo-European Mediterranean language. It's not an Indo-European root, hmm. but it's from, you know, the, the Mediterranean from, you know. Mm, where figs grow. Where yes. figs grow. <laughs> and the Greek form of the word fig has as a cognate the word sycamore, which is. Because mm -hmm. it's sycos. Yeah, yeah sycos. Sycos, yeah. which is where you get the fig from the sycamore tree. So that's not surprising at all. But the, wait, 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 wait. Must be a different kind of sycamores. There's a different kind of, I think there's a new world sycamore, which is yeah. totally unrelated yeah. to the old <laughs> world like, sycamore. No, no, no. We do not get figs from sycamores. Okay. Not yeah. No, American I, sycamores. I, I, I believe you. Just double, yes. A sycamore is a name which has been applied various times to several different types of trees, but with somewhat similar leaf forms. The old world sycamore is Platanus orientalis. Okay. I believe this is the one that we get the figs from. So there's another plant. The Ficus sycamorus. Ah, that's the one. Sycamore or sy of the Bible, the biblical sycamore. Is the one with a, a species of fig, also called the sycamore fig or fig mulberry. Right. Sycamore or sycamore is a fig species that has been cult cultivated since ancient times. Okay. Sorry, I just, yeah, there's a new world sycamore yes. that has, that is not in any way related to that. This is a common problem. There's so many new world plants that are that ha they gave the same because name because of some resemblance of the leaf or whatever um, that have <laughs> yet another problem yeah, yeah. of colonialism. <laughs> okay, sorry. Getting back to this, this. so the relationship between mm -hmm. fig and sycamore, the biblical sycamore, yeah. I guess, is not surprising. But what is surprising is the, that the word sycophant, yes, is comes from this. this. Story, yes. <laughs> we all know where this. Well, not we all know. You know where this yes. is going. So sycophant originally started out meaning slanderer. Mm -hmm. And this comes about from a rude gesture. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you wish to describe this rude no, gesture? No, you okay. go right ahead. <laughs> so it's sticking the thumb between two fingers, which is meant to represent both the interior of a fig and the vagina. Because that's the thing. And this is called showing the fig, this mm -hmm. gesture, which apparently ancient Athenian politicians urged their followers to do to their opponents, to make this gesture to their opponents, while themselves pretending that they were above such <laughs> vulgarity. <laughs> Which, that's the part of that story that I don't understand, because Athenian politicians weren't above any kind of vulgarity. <laughs> they were totally okay with vulgarity. They were not concerned about being vulgar at all. So I don't really fully understand that part. But anyway. <laughs> so, you know, in the tradition of ruining Christmas, you can tell the story <laughs> over your figgy pudding and, and demonstrate the gesture to other guests at the table. But we will not be held responsible for any family arguments that start after it. So the other thing, of course, is the Christmas cake. Which again, like plum pudding, is a fruit cake which can be made for other occasions. It's just it is also associated with Christmas. I mean, fruit cake is associated with weddings too, mm. and it's really the same thing. So Christmas cake is just a richer version of it. And I don't have a lot to say about it, other than the tradition of hiding little trinkets in it, which I talked about with the pudding. Mm -hmm. That actually is goes back further in the Twelfth Night cake. Yes. So the, that's really where that tradition. Um, goes back to, but I am told that Queen Victoria banned at the Twelfth Night celebrations in the 1870s because yep. they had come become unruly and out of, kind of got out of hand. So they transferred the tradition of the Twelfth Night cake over mm -hmm. to the Christmas cake. So now Christmas cakes sometimes have those things tr uh, in them, or the pudding, mm -hmm. or both. I don't remember now whether we had it in, in the Christmas cake or the pudding, but we certainly did when Nanny was uh, mm -hmm. baking them for us when we were young. She also used to do the Christmas cake, the fruit cake, in the traditional way of adding a layer of marzipan onto it 
and then uh, royal icing, mm-hmm. topping, and decorations, mm-hmm. and like fancy ones, like skating rinks and Christmas mm-hmm. trees and really fancy decorations, which we've never done on our Christmas cakes. But I do remember them very fondly as being quite amazing. I hated Christmas cake and never ate it, but it looked really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So that's really, I don't really have anything more to say about Christmas cake. So you don't feel tempted to draw a line between Christmas cake and Saturnalia? No. The, the, it's basically the, putting the trinket in. And the bean and the misrule. Yeah, yeah lots of people talk about that. I, yeah. I mean, the idea being that it goes back to the Saturnalia Roman festival at the solstice and that it was about flipping things around. And yeah. But I mean, at that time, it wasn't, you didn't have to find any trinket. You just... Mm-hmm. If you were a slave, you got to be the master for a night. Right. And then this idea that the cake has, the Twelfth Night cake had a bean in it. And the one who found the bean was the Lord of Misrule for the night, mm-hmm. including no matter who he was. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> these the links links between Christian tra- traditions and Roman traditions are always really tenuous. Yeah, yeah. The idea of misrule around the middle of December, sure, maybe it goes back that far. Tying the Christmas cake specifically to Saturnalia seems a little far-fetched. But. Right. Well, I can address the word cake itself. Okay. So it comes into English in the 13th century, uh, referring to a thin mass of baked dough. Mm-hmm. comes from a Germanic root. So there's West Germanic kokon to refer to such a, a loaf, mm-hmm. a, a mass mm-hmm. of, of dough. It is not related, as you might think, to Latin kokora. To cook. To cook, and therefore not related to cook, the word cook, mm-hmm. which comes from cockroach. So it's not a cooked thing. It's not a cooked thing, though it was that had suggestion had been made earlier on by earlier etymologists. Cookie is related to cake, not to cook. Okay. <laughs> though you might, again, <laughs> be surprised, by, be that. surprised yeah. by that. So a cookie is, is from a, a diminutive form of the Dutch word, mm. a little cake, basically. Okay. And so that, that comes from that Germanic root. Forever muddying the waters about what's a cake and what's a cookie. What's a cookie, yes. The, in the terms of the Jaffa cake. Yes, the Jaffa cake, uh, which, which is all about how you tax. Mm-hmm. What gets taxed <laughs> what and what gets doesn't. Taxed in what specifically way. UK you, In the UK, mm-hmm. yeah. So there you go. A, a cookie is a cake, but it's not a cooked thing. Right. <laughs> and then the other thing is a mincemeat tart that goes along with this. Mm-hmm. And here we see that same conflation of sweet stuff and meat. So... We talked about the plum pudding as often having meat Mm -hmm, in it, as mm -hmm. well as sweet things. Mince meat comes out of medieval pies of flesh and fowl and fruits and spices all mingled together. Mm -hmm. They, a particular kind, started to be baked in rectangular shapes to symbolize Jesus's crib Mm -hmm. around Christmas. This idolatry was banned by Puritans in England and in the colonies. Those ball sports. So people just changed the shape Mm. and made them circular instead. Right. So they weren't Jesus crib shaped. And they were renamed minced pies because of the minced meat Meat. Mm -hmm. in it. But in the 19th century, they dropped the meat out of the recipe completely. And it was only then fruit and sugar. But they kept the name. Potentially some... But suet again. Suet, yeah. Suet again, yeah. But still... Still some meat product in it. But but not actual meat. Not actual meat. But they kept the name. Right. Minced pies. Mm -hmm. In spite of the fact that the meat was no longer in there. And that's really all I have about them. So mincemeat, the word itself, Mm -hmm. comes about in the 1660s as a single word, Mm -hmm. mincemeat, as opposed to minced and meat. Mm -hmm. And originally in the figurative sense of what someone plans to make of his enemy. So making mincemeat of someone comes first before the... Comes first, it seems, yeah. Or at least Uh, it's recorded first. As recorded first. It's an alteration of minced meat. So two separate words, which predates it. It comes from the 1570s. Hmm. from mince and meat. A minced pie is attested in 1600, which is a rhyming slang for I. So minced pie, pie rhymes with I. So minced means I. I. But it's not attested as rhyming slang in this 15th No, no. That, so that's century. attested yeah. in uh, 1857. Yeah, yeah. Rhyming slang is much later. Much later, yeah. yeah. Now, the word mince itself comes from the late 14th century, just on its own. Right. Referring to the idea of chopping into little pieces Mm -hmm. from Old French mancier, to make into small pieces. Basically from Latin minutiare, to make small. Mm -hmm. From minus. Minus. Smaller. Small. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's had a number of figurative senses over the years, including to walk. It's yes. a way of walking, min- mincing, mincing. Uh, walk Taking with short, steps, precise yeah. steps. That dates to 1560s. Mm-hmm. 
tart, as in mint tart, yeah. and, and the various types of tarts mm -hmm. that we can talk about, as in a small pie, comes from Old French, possibly an alteration from late Latin torta, mm -hmm. which perhaps comes from the past participle of the verb torquera, to turn, to twist. Mm -hmm. So I guess it has something to do with the m making of the pastry itself. Mm. The process of making the pastry to turn the pastry. Sure, th that does not really make any sense when you think about <laughs> how pastry is made. made. But that's the the uh, the best guess as to right, where, it, where comes it comes from. from. Okay, so mince pies, uh, mince meat tarts again. Um, they're probably even more strongly associated with Christmas, in fact, traditionally mm -hmm. than pudding, mm -hmm. even as the the dessert on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. The other thing we make, though, every year for Christmas that is definitely a thing that we make that is also a Christmas mm -hmm. uh, association is shortbread. Shortbread, yeah. And that's a particularly Scottish association with Christmas. So again, shortbread can be made for any time of the year, but it's particularly associated with Christmas. <laughs> again, I found multiple stories that I am not sure about. I think they might be much like some of these others that they get canonized as stories in the 19th century. The story of shortbread begins with the medieval biscuit bread. Any leftover dough from bread making was dried out in a low oven until it hardened into a type of rusk. The word biscuit means twice cooked. Gradually, the yeast in the bread was replaced by butter, and biscuit bread developed into shortbread. That is a quotation that I have found in multiple sites. Now, okay, if they mean that biscuits come from biscuit, twice cooked bread, I'm with them on that. Gradually, the yeast was replaced with butter? What does that even mean? How do you make bread where you gradually, <laughs> gradually replace, replace the yeast how do you with gradually butter? Gradually replace yeast. Th those are not. <laughs> it's either doesn't yeast make or not any sense. <laughs> exactly, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. Okay. The idea that, that there was bread that was dried out, sprinkled with sugar or some other thing, and mm -hmm. cooked again to make cookies, and then later somebody was like, "Hey, why don't we skip the making bread part mm. and just make them into cookies and call them?" But they were still called biscuits. Sure, but that's not what it says. I don't know what that means, mm. but I found it all over the place as the story of shortbread mm. and why it's, I guess, bread. Right. But, I mean, surely it's just bread because it's baked. Mm. Anyway, the other thing is that shortbread has been attributed to Mary, Queen of Scots. Mm. And again, anything attributed to Mary, Queen of Scots, I'm like, really? Everything's attributed to her. Who in the mid-16th century was said to be very fond of petticoat tails, a thin, crisp, buttery shortbread originally flavored with caraway seeds. It does look like you can go quite far back and find cookies that were made with sugar and butter and flour and often caraway seeds. Mm -hmm. And that that was a cookie that mm -hmm. was important in Scotland. The petticoat tails thing, there's a long, complicated discussion about what that means and what that, that has to do with when you bake a shortbread in a circle and then cut it into pieces, like wedges. Those are petticoat tails and what that means. I'm skeptical about all of it. I don't think any of it sounds like it has really good sources. It all sounds like folklore to me. But shortbread is traditionally a mix of wheat flour and rice flour and butter and sugar. The recipe that we make, that my family makes, does not have rice flour. It uses corn flour or cornstarch. Mm -hmm. And the, the very traditional recipe that we use is the one off the back of the box <laughs> from the cornstarch right. recipe. And uh, that has been canon. I now have it in my hand copied recipe book for family recipes, but it comes from a cornstarch box. Right. But it's really good. Yep. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Shortbread is often made either traditionally either in a circle and cut into those wedges or in individual rounds, pressed, or in a mold mm -hmm. um, with, which has a design on it where mm -hmm. you turn it out. So those are sort of the way it's done. That's really all I have to say about that. Well, there's not much to say about the word shortening itself. I mean, ultimately, we don't know for sure where it comes from, but it may have to do with the short fibers involved in shortbread. Shortbread. Or the reason it's called shortbread is usually said to be that it is very short. Yeah. That is, it has a lot of fat in it. It's, yeah. Well, it, and that it's very crumbly is mm -hmm. specifically the, uh, the, the etymological notion. and easily crumbled mm -hmm. is the 15th century sense of short. Right. As opposed to bread or something mm -hmm. where it stretches. Mm -hmm. So the last one I wanted to talk about is tortière, mm -hmm. which your mom makes every year for yep. Christmas. Tortière is, okay, I'm going to read from the Canadian Encyclopedia Online. Tortière is a double-crusted meat pie that is likely named for a shallow pie dish still used for cooking and serving tourte 
or pies in France. The chopped or ground filling usually includes pork and is sometimes mixed with other meats, including local games such as rabbit, pheasant, or mousse. It is famously served as part of Réveillon, a traditional feast enjoyed by Catholic Québécois, 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 after midnight mass on Christmas Eve. Tortière can be a shallow pie that is filled with pork or other meats, or a many layered pie that is filled with cubed meats and vegetables, which is the way the dish is prepared along the shores of the Saguenay and Lac Saint-Jean. Acadians living in the Maritimes called their version of tourtière by its common name, pâte à viande. So we know it as part of the réveillon, which mm -hmm. your family doesn't really do anymore, but used to. Mm -hmm. So réveillon is the midnight mass and the celebration after midnight mass. Mm -hmm. So on Christmas Eve, everyone goes to bed early and then wakes up again, or the goes kids are go to bed early and mm -hmm. wakes up again, go to midnight mass. And then after midnight mass, you have another dinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, with cold meats and seafood, seafood. and tortières mm -hmm. and dancing. Yeah. Those, and you dance to the wee hours and have presents then too mm -hmm. sometimes. And we've kind of not done that with your family, but uh, we've just done a Christmas Eve celebration and right. we usually have tortières. Mm -hmm. So I looked into tortières and I ended up going out to our public library to get a book called What's to Eat? Entrées in Canadian Food History from 2012 that has all sorts of interesting essays in it, but one of them is about the history of the tortière by Jean-Pierre Lamasson. And he, so he specifically is talking about the Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean tortière, which right. is mentioned there uh, as a particular kind of tortière, mm -hmm. which is not the kind, I'll get to this, but it's not the kind your mom makes. Okay. And he starts way back at the Babylonian pie recipes. <laughs> 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 then he goes to Apicius's patina as right. the sort of beginning of pies. Then he goes to the tourte parmenienne which is a multi-meat and currants and sugar and spices pie. Mm -hmm. And the English battle pie. These are both really deep dish pies with like fancy crenellated pastry on them that, right. are, that are high status, abundant luxury foods that are served to lords and on the royal table, like mm -hmm. multiple meats overflowing with goodness. Mm -hmm. By the 17th century, he says cookbooks in France have a pro proliferation of pies, lots of pies. But by the 19th century, the pie was no longer a high status dish in France or England, though the pie continued to be on the tables of the sort of English gentry middle class. Right. And so we get like steak and kidney pie, like pies right. do continue to be important. But in, fr in French cooking, pies, covered pies, mm -hmm. kind of drop out of favor as high status. And in the English cuisine that is very French influenced, mm -hmm. it also drops out. All right, so that's sort of the European tradition. But we're talking about tortière, so we want to know where does the tortière come from in, in Quebec? Mm -hmm. Well, there's something called a sea pie, mm -hmm. S-E-A-P-I-E, sea pie, in New England. Hmm. Probably a British naval dish. That's probably why it's called sea pie. Right. It's mixed diced meat and poultry. It's a raised pie, that is sort of deep dish. And it seems to be a direct ancestor of the tortière. And it's found in the 18th, in a late 18th century American colonist cookbook, which is the first sort of American or mm. new, new world cookbook that we have. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have entered Quebec through the Gaspésie. Mm -hmm. And the sea pie seems to have become sort of Frenchified in term, uh, phonetically as sea pie. C-I-P-A-I-L-L-E. Sea pie. Though there's a bunch of different names for it. Sea uh, pat. Uh, this seems to have been sort of reconciled as meaning six somethings mm -hmm. as well. The sea pie is characterized by layered ingredients. And this is something he talks about in different kinds of pies as being layered, but where you have like different meats, meats oh, okay. and layers of mm -hmm. meats and other ingredients. And then you sort of, you layer them inside a pastry, you pour a broth or water over it, you cover it over and then you cook it. Okay. And that's the sea pie. Uh, around 1770 with English rule, mm -hmm. potatoes arrive in Quebec. Okay. So it's about 1770. And so Quebec cooking starts to have potatoes and immediately you start to see sea pie recipes that are have potatoes either as a layer or as a division between the layers. Ah, okay. So you get meat and potatoes in layers mm -hmm. in the sea pie. At some point, so the sea pie is, is found all along the St. Lawrence in the Gaspésie and all, all along the St. Lawrence River. At some point, it seems to move somehow from the St. Lawrence and it, you still have the sea pie now, but moves to Lac Saint-Jean and how it moves there to the Saguenay Lac Saint-Jean region, which is way from the river, is not clear, but clearly there must have been a movement of people, this person argues. And so at some point it moves to this region and becomes renamed the Tortière after the dish in which the tourte is cooked. Right. So you have a tourte is just the word for tart, is the word for mm -hmm. pie, and the dish is the Tortière. 
And this is a quite common mm -hmm. thing, like a tagine being named after the dish in which the tagine is cooked. And it also loses the layers. Somewhere in this process, it stops being a layered dish. Okay. So the Lac Saint-Jean Saguenay Tortière then becomes this diced meat, mm -hmm. multiple meat, pork and other meats, mm -hmm. game often, and potatoes and broth and onions. And, and that, that's mm -hmm. what a Saguenay mm -hmm. uh, Tortière is. And then this author talks about how the homogenization of the terminology as tortière, not cipai, mm -hmm. because it's interchangeable for quite a long time, doesn't really occur until the Quiet Revolution. Oh, really? So really quite late. Mm. And the cookbooks of the 1970s, where you get a lot of these sort of national mm -hmm. cookbooks, and national in this context meaning Québécois, right. provincial, mm -hmm. where they established la tortière as the name and the dish is a firmly Québécois cultural item, specifically with the Lac Saint-Jean Saguenay tortière as becoming this iconic national mm. dish. Mm -hmm. But it's a, along with Quebec nationalism right. that this becomes really important. And you get the sort of imagining of the tortière as this traditional dish, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact as this demonstrates it's a British dish right. imported from America, from America right. into Quebec. Hmm. Not that there isn't a tr tradition of meat pies in every culture, mm -hmm. but specifically, at least this, this author's argument is that it comes from this particular British dish. So I thought that was all very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, that Saguenay dish is very different than the one. So when we make our tortière, it's, or when your mum makes it, it's with ground meat yeah. and Often no potato. No, yeah. The can sometimes be potato and a little bit of flavoring and, mm -hmm. and not the onions and stuff. So it's, it's quite different. Yeah. I'm kind of curious sometime to make a Saguenay tortilla now, now. Mm. having read about it. Interesting. But yeah, it does seem to be a very specific kind of thing. Mm. So anyway, that's tortilla. Well, all I can add to that is the etymology of réveillon. Oh, yes. It comes basically ultimately from the Latin elements Re, meaning again, A or X, meaning out of or from, and vigilo, watch. Yeah, So it's to stay awake. Yeah, yeah. so it's to wake up again, I guess, mm -hmm. is the idea. Right, which makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So that's really all I had. Now, you have wanted to talk about I have One last drinks. thing. Drinks, specifically, if you're going to a Christmas party anytime in the next few days, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> you will undoubtedly be offered some mulled wine or mulled cider or some hot drink like that. It's mm -hmm. a traditional mm -hmm. sort of thing at Christmas parties. And this goes back to a medieval tradition specifically called the wassail, mm -hmm. as in the carol. Here we come a wassailing. Here we yeah. come a wassailing. So wassail comes from an old English expression, wis hal, meaning be hail or be in good health. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of toast. Mull, by the way, comes from around, it, so it first appears in English around 1600 mm -hmm. uh, to refer to a sweet, sweetened, spiced and heated drink. It's not certain where the word comes from, but it's perhaps from Dutch mull, meaning a, a kind of white sweet beer. Or mm. from Flemish, mola, referring again to a kind of beer, related uh, to words for soften. So it's a softened beer, basically, oh, okay. is the idea. Now, I, I mentioned that Wishal is a sort of toast, and that's appropriate because a medieval wassail cup, a wassail drink, mm -hmm. originally contained toast. Toasted <laughs> actual bread, toast. actual <laughs> toast, as well as all kinds of other things that you might not think of, including in a modern a drink. mulled drink or whatever. <laughs> so things like eggs and nuts and cream and so forth. Yeah. More of a soup, really. Yeah. Drinks, the whole ancient <laughs> ancient and medieval world didn't understand drinks. Drinks, yes. Drinks are supposed to be liquid, people. <laughs> it's like those drinks that the Greeks drank that were had barley mm. and cheese in them. Yes. Like, I... <sighs> well, it's, it's you know, you, you can see the, the sort of, again, thinking of soups, rather. We put bits of crouton toasted bread in soup yeah, so soups not drinks soups, not drinks well. <laughs> but yes yes but this is indeed where we get the expression to drink a toast mm -hmm. the toast in the wassail or the toast in the whatever kind of drink you're talking about and the expression the toast of the town as well yeah and this is a story that seems to be to some extent you know well attested in print in spite of the I know because I know what story you're about to tell, in spite of the fact it sounds it entirely sounds like it's apocryphal. <laughs> yes. But there is a story in the Tatler, a early 18th century periodical that tells basically of two gentlemen in the town of Bath upon seeing a beautiful woman <laughs> taking uh, a bath in the public baths. 
that were there that people went to you know bathe for their health it was thought to to be a good health giving thing and a gallant if somewhat saucy gentleman one of them uh, scooped up a drink from the water and drank to her health i think it's just gross frankly <laughs> but there you go <laughs> well his even more witty companion stated that he didn't much care for the drink but he'd have the toast in other words the woman the thing floating in it. The thing floating in the water. Yes. <laughs> this is supposedly where the word to drink a toast comes from. I still think it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. So you can drink your toasts to that notion this Christmas season. <laughs> have a Christmas toast. <laughs> have a have a, a mulled cider and think of that woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know there's a lot more Christmas treats we could talk about but i think we're gonna have to wait for another year because we've been way long tonight already <laughs> <laughs> and i noticed you haven't finished your drink but i feel like maybe you don't want to i've left the sort of layer of uh grenadine mostly grenadine at the bottom so all right know. fair enough <laughs> well have a happy holiday season whatever you are or are not celebrating over this next week or two i hope at least you're getting a little bit of time to rest and recharge and we'll be back again in January. Thanks for another year of listening along with us. And here's to you. Cheers. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.